was at the uh, hospital on Friday, I got a call from uh, Sister Sandra, and I think most of you know Sandra. She's in her mid-80s now. She's been serving the Lord for 60-plus years. Got saved when she was 13. Uh, loves the Lord with all of her heart. So I didn't know this until Friday, but Thursday she went to the shopping center on the far end of town where the dollar store is. It's up by Francisco's Country Kitchen up in the north end of town. And uh, she went into the dollar store to buy uh, things for the children for her ministry on Sunday. And uh, she had a sack full of things and was walking across the parking lot. And a truck pulled into the parking lot and knocked her down, uh, broke her clavicle, and then ran over her and uh, backed back up over her and took off out of the parking lot. So, um, thank God these young people carry telephones with them all the time, cell phones, and somebody got a picture. So the police took it to their forensic department and got the license number. They've confiscated the truck, but uh, unfortunately nobody knows where this person is. So I got a call from her daughter this morning out of Wyoming, and they're on their way. Anyway, we need to pray for Sandra. Um, she's not in ICU anymore. She's in another part of the hospital where they've got her on a ventilator. And uh, I believe in our God. is a God of miracles. And uh, there's nothing impossible with him. So I want you to just uh, pray with me this morning for our sister, for her family. And uh, I also want to pray for this man that ran and left an old lady in the parking lot bleeding. Uh, God knows where he is, and I'm praying that the Lord will find him wherever he is and bring him to the truth and to justice. Um, and I'm just going to be honest with you, church. We need to pray for our town. We have an incredible amount of lawless people here who run stop signs, traffic lights, uh, try to hit people in pedestrian lanes, etc. And I know I'm tired of it, and I believe you all are too. And we need to pray for our police to st stand up and start giving out tickets and stop this foolishness that's happened in our town. Amen? So let's pray. Father, you know our hearts already. And we know that someday each one of us are going to leave this body and be joined together with you in glory. That's our hope and that's your promise. So we don't worry about eternity. But while we're here, Father, we're very concerned about this earthly life. And so first of all, we want to lift up the doctors and the nurses and those who are caring for Sandra. And of course, Father, we want your perfect will to be done, and we know that it will. But Father, if it be thy will to heal our sister, she's so strong. And she has such faith in you. And her, her last words before they loaded her into the ambulance were, please, please tell the children that I love them. So Lord, she's your daughter. We love her dearly. And we pray that you will heal her. Give her a miracle. And Father, we'll accept whatever healing you give her, whether it's earthly or heavenly. But we pray for this family today, for Diana, 
for Steve and for April and Michael and little Asher and all the grandchildren who are gathered there that you will give them peace and comfort in their spirit. And Lord, you are the God of heaven and earth. There is nothing too difficult for you. So we leave this in your hands and your perfect will to be done. We trust you, Father. Now, Lord, I, I want to pray for this man who abandoned her in the parking lot and left. I pray you would send out angels from heaven and find him and show him to do the right thing, Lord, to face the justice that he deserves. And I pray that through that, you would talk to him about his salvation, his eternity. For Lord, I can't imagine anyone who's so callous that they would run over an old woman and back, back up over her and then leave. So I ask, Father God, that you break up the rocky ground of that hard heart and that you bring him to your justice, Lord. And I pray for my church family here today, Father. We are in perilous times. It doesn't take anyone with a lot of intelligence to see that. So Lord, help us to stand in these days and not be half-hearted and not come see, come saw, whatever we feel like doing. But Lord, as I put in the bulletin today, help us to take advantage of the services that are offered to us and the times we're offered to be together in fellowship. And Lord, I pray today as I share your word that you will help us to not be deceived in any way from what's going on in this world. Father, I thank you for all that are praying here this morning. And I thank you, Father God, that you hear our prayers. I love your promise, which is my life verse. Call unto me, says the Lord, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which you do not know. So, Father, thank you for being the loving Father that you are. Now I pray you will minister to us in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. I first met Sandra in 1982. I was doing a funeral for 400 outlaw motorcycle people. Their president had been shot and murdered. And uh, Sandra and her husband, the former pastor of this church, were at that funeral because their son belonged to that group. So I thank God that over 50 years we prayed for him and he has come to Christ. And he's on his way from Louisiana and he'll be here tonight. So God is a God of miracles, and God can save, and God can heal. So we're going to believe that. Amen? Amen. So my message this morning is called, We Are Walking in the Days of Deception. We Are Walking in the Days of Deception. And I really appreciate what you prayed, Jennifer. Uh, protection over the children as they go to school, and uh, some try to perpetrate lies into their little spirits. That God is able, God is able to keep them pure. He's able to keep them safe. So church, we live in a time where deception is so strong that a majority of people, in my opinion, have believed the lies of the enemy. That's just a fact. I speak with different minister friends that I have and uh, they don't like to admit it, but they say, you know, why aren't our churches full? In the terrible, perilous times 
that we're living in, why aren't the churches full? Why aren't the people praying? Well, I believe that many have believed the lie of the enemy. And here's why. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are perishing, because they refused to receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved, God himself will send them a strong delusion, and they will believe a lie, that they all might be damned who had pleasure in unrighteousness and would not believe the truth. That's just a fact. That's scripture. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1 and verse 28, because they did those things which are inconvenient, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, and that's what we're dealing with. Now, we're in a, a day and an age when we're dealing with people who don't want to hear the truth. They believe the lie. And it's still up to us, we have no excuse, to shine the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and to proclaim the blessing and the power of God over people's lives and to speak to them about the gospel. I want you to know that in 1979, I was still lost as could be, riding my Harley Chopper wherever I wanted to go and doing whatever I wanted to do, and people pretty much stayed out of our way. And I had so many Christians in 1979 talk to me about Jesus Christ, and I blew them off. Uh, one lady, I, I never forget this, because it was the day I was baptized. Before that ever happened, uh, I was in front of a motorcycle shop with my friends, and this lady had a lisp. Her, something was wrong with her lip, and she come walking up the street, very well-dressed lady, holding a Bible in her hand, and was talking to us about Jesus, and we just insulted her, blew her off. And God has a great sense of humor. A year, a year later, I was saved, got baptized in her church, and she was sitting on the front row. So God always gets the last laugh. Amen? Amen. He gets the first laugh, too. Fact of it is, we're constantly being bombarded with lies from the enemy through media, through others. So much negativity. So... I sought in scripture to find some verses that God would help me to understand what's happening in our land. And I came to Isaiah chapter 5. So if you'll turn there with me, Isaiah chapter 5, starting with verse 13. I guess my question was, Lord, why are so many people going into captivity? Why are so many people deceived? I don't understand. And the Lord reminded me how deceived I was. Until I bowed my knee and accepted the truth that Jesus really did love me. And that he really did die on the cross for me. And that they murdered him and put him in a tomb and sealed it with a huge stone. But that stone could not hold back the power and the Son of God. He rose the third day to give us life. And man, when that truth came into my spirit, I was what the Apostle John calls in chapter 3, born again. In other words, I had experienced the natural birth, as we all have. By the way, when people have a trouble describing a woman, what is a woman? Um, here, here, here's a fact. We were all born through one. It's unbelievable the deception that has fallen upon people. So Isaiah 5.13 says, Therefore my people have gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished and their multitude are dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell has enlarged its mouth and opened its mouth beyond measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp and the one who is jubilant shall descend into it. 
people will be brought down. Each man will be humbled. And the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts will be exalted in judgment. And God who is holy will be hallowed in righteousness. Then the lambs will feed in their pasture. And in the waste places the fat ones and strangers shall eat. Verse 18 says, But woe unto those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity, as sin as with a cart rope. And they say, Let him make speed and quicken his work so that we can see it. And let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw near and come so that we may know it. But woe unto those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, and who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto those that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And woe to men who are mighty at drinking wine. Woe to men valiant for mixing intoxicating drink who justify the wicked for a bribe and then they take away justice from the righteous man. Therefore God says as the fire devours the stubble and as the flame consumes the chaff so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will ascend like dust because they have rejected the law of the Lord of hosts and they have despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Someone might say, well, that's Old Testament. That's Bible. We have the same God yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. Numbers 23.19 says, God is not a man that he would lie, neither the son of man that he would repent or change his mind. Has he said and shall he not do it? Has God spoken and will it not come to pass? That's what that scripture says. Malachi 3.6 says, I am the God of Jacob. I do not change. God is the same. He's the same all the time. He's a God of love for his children, and he's a God of wrath for those who reject him. You know, John chapter 3 is one of the most famous scriptures in the Bible, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Did you know that God talked about perish before he talked about everlasting life? He was so concerned with humanity and their rejection of him that he said, I found a way for you not to perish and to have everlasting life. And it's found right at the very end of John chapter 3, verse 36, where Jesus said, He that believes in me has, now possesses, eternal life. And then he goes on to say, But he that will not receive me, he who does not believe, shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. It's a message that's not popular in today's pulpits. Uh, in fact, I think there's a lot of preachers that are very discouraged. They've shut down their Wednesday night service. They've shut down their Sunday night service. They come once a week on Sunday morning and think that's going to do it. And I'll tell you what, we meet five times a week. And that's not going to do it either. What's going to do it is a personal relationship. One that we sit with our Lord and commune with him and pray with him and talk with him so that when we do come to worship together he can confirm what he's already said to us all week long amen yes. yeah I don't I don't go to church to get revelation I go to church to get confirmation already what God has spoken to me that I can come and hear yes that's exactly what the Lord's been saying to me amen praise God so it in these scriptures that I read, it became obvious to the prophet Isaiah that the people of Israel had been deceived. How did that happen? 
So there are some scriptures, and I've read a few this morning, but I want to go back. Number one, big number one, they refused to believe God's truth. Now, let me say that again. I didn't say they wouldn't hear God's truth. I said they wouldn't believe God's truth. You see, there's people that say, look, I prayed the prayer for Jesus to come into my heart. I have my ticket to heaven. I'm good to go. I don't need to do anything. Well, that's not even scriptural. There's no, there's no prayer that you pray for Jesus to come into your heart. What there is, is the word of God to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And then we have to repent. Repent means stop the behavior, turn around, face God, and say, I need a Savior. That's what happened to me on November 4th, 1980, at 2.30 in the morning. There was a smoking 45 automatic laying on the floor. Thank God the bullet hit the fireplace instead of me. And I fell to my knees and said, I'm tired of living this way. If all these people that are telling me about you, Jesus, are real, then I'm asking you to come into my life now. I want to stop this insanity. I want to have life like they've talked about. And I spent a couple of hours on the floor crying and begging and asking God to forgive me of all the different things that I could think of. I went so far back that I confessed stealing quarters from my grandpa's uh, drawer to go play pinball machines. I mean, that's how far back I went. God, please wash me clean. I'm tired of this. And to my amazement and my shock, he did. He came in, the old guy left, and I praise the Lord for his mercy and his grace. And people need to hear that. They need to hear that. It's not about coming to church. I think coming to church is to build one another up and, and get ammunition, spiritual ammunition, to go out and confront the world. And boy, do they need to be confronted. It is insane. So 2 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul, all your T's are together in the New Testament. They're about two-thirds of the way through your New Testament. 2 Thessalonians... And chapter 2, starting with verse 7. The Holy Spirit tells Paul to write this. The mystery of lawlessness, you see it everywhere. I love to get on the freeway in a, in a, in a big car with lots of metal around me. I won't ride my motorcycle on the freeway anymore. I go on back roads. And I used to ride dirt bikes too, so if somebody's coming at me, I can go off into the dirt. That's hard to do in a car. Lawlessness. People can't wait to get past you. The speed limit says 65 and 85 isn't fast enough. Stop. It says stop. It's pretty plain. It's red. And people just ignore it. They do damage to others and then walk away or they walk into a store and steal all kinds of things and walk out in their pride and arrogance. And the Apostle Paul says, because the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That verse is talking about the Holy Spirit who restrains us. I thank God I'm saved. Otherwise, I'd probably be in jail. With all the insanity that's going on, I would have jumped bad on a bunch of people already. And you say, well, you're too old. No, I'm not. I'm not too old yet. But thank God I'm saved because the Holy Spirit restrains me. He restrains you. He tells you this isn't good behavior. You need to stop. But you know what? With the majority of the people not knowing the Lord, there's no restraint for them. So when are they going to jump bad? How much can they be pushed before they flip out? Amen? They're already disobeying the law. They're already going into stores stealing. That's crazy. 
If I would tell my father that I worked for before I joined the United States Navy, Dad, they're going to come into the store and just steal whatever they want, my dad would have got out his shotgun and said, bring them on. That was, that was the way things were restrained back in those days. In the 1960s and 70s, people said, you think you're bad enough, try it. Nowadays, we've been taught, well, now don't offend anyone. Well, I got to tell you, Jesus offended everyone. The gospel is offensive. The cross is offensive. Sin is offensive. And God is love. And he wants us to repent. In verse 8, he says, the lawless one is going to be revealed. The Lord will consume him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him with the brightness of his coming. So when we come back with the Lord Jesus, that's the first thing that's going to happen is the dirty devil is going to be thrown into a pit with a chain. A great angel is going to take a chain and tie him up for a thousand years. Hallelujah. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who were perishing, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, for this reason God will send them a strong delusion. That's the only answer. I mean, I graduated from high school. That's as high as I went in, in education. But God has taught me a lot of common sense, you know, like there's two genders, male and female. It's always going to stay that way in this church. If they make a rule that you got to put all gender on the bathrooms, that ain't going to happen. None of this craziness is going to enter into this place or into my life. I refuse to shop at a store that says, oh, anybody can go in. Did you hear the story about the police that showed up and there was a man laying on the ground and his teeth were all over the ground and there was a man standing there with his teenage daughter. Did you hear that one? Well, apparently this man uh, took his daughter uh, to a park and she had to go to the restroom, so he walked her to the restroom and she started to go into the restroom and this man started to walk in after her. And then the police showed up. So the police said, why is he on the ground and why are his teeth all over the parking lot? And he said, well, that guy said he identified as a woman and I told him I identified as the tooth fairy. <laughs> I think any man that would not protect his family or his daughter is worse than an infidel and has denied the faith, period. That's Bible. God said for those who won't provide for their own, especially they have his own household, they're worse than an infidel, and they've denied the faith. So it is time, Christians, it is time for us to stand up and say that isn't right, and we're not accepting it. You say, you're going to offend people. I love to. I love to see if they'll come to the truth. Someone recently at the UPS when I took my package there, I couldn't tell if it was a male or a female, so I didn't say anything. But then he said, you know, uh, I identify, and he went on with the identification, as, and I just said, well, I don't, I don't accept that. Uh, I think you need to get checked out for mental illness. Other than that, here's my package, and I'm out of here. You know, I don't care anymore because people are mentally ill they have received a spirit of deception and their soul is going to spend eternity somewhere and my heart tells me God saved you you miserable rat it's time for you to help some others come to Jesus too you know yeah I don't agree with what they do and I don't agree with what they say but they still have a soul and they still need to be saved and they still need to hear the truth and the truth will set them free according to our Savior. So the people were deceived because they were hearing some things, but they didn't test what they were hearing. So if we don't test what we're hearing, we're going to be deceived. How do you test it? Well, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, 
So all the way to the end of your Bible, right before Revelation, you'll get into uh, 1 John, 1 John chapter 4. And verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they're from God. So, I think you should test me while I'm speaking. Apostle Paul said so. When he went to Berea, he said the Bereans, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, the Bereans were more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica. And that the Bereans searched the scriptures every day to see if the things that Paul was saying were true. And I don't believe we need to be weaklings in the Lord. I believe we need to know our Bible. I believe we need to know what to say. Look, I never went to Bible college. I, I, I wouldn't darken the door of one. I got saved, and I had a pastor who preached like I'm preaching today. And I started reading the Bible and finding out some truths and moving away some lies that I had believed. And then I started to tell my friends about it. And they got offended, but then they finally got saved and baptized. Huh, Patty? Five of them in the, in the first church. Patty was in the... Actually, Patty was there when I got baptized on November 4th, 1980. And it's amazing that you're just turned 36. I, <laughs> I thank God that five of my biker friends got saved. And they got saved because I shared the word of God with them and was like a hornet after them. And finally they couldn't escape and they repented and they came to Jesus Christ. And, and I'm nobody. I mean, I'm just a Christian. But God can use any Christian that says, I got a burden for people going to hell. You know, and I know it's not a popular subject. One famous evangelist who fills up football stadiums every, every Sunday and has thousands and thousands of people worshiping him in his books he was asked by Larry King on an interview, Preacher, how come you don't talk about hell? He said, oh, that, that's negative. We don't, we don't bring in, there's too much negativity. We don't talk about negative things. We want people to be positive. Well, I want people to be positive too, but I don't want to stand at the great white throne judgment and have somebody point their bony finger at me and say, you knew him in truth and glory but you never told me the story. We walked and talked day and night on this earth. You never told me about the, about the new birth. Amen? Because we will give an account. God says in Isaiah 43.10, You are my witnesses, saith the Lord. God tells us in Ezekiel chapter 3, Warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, you will surely die, warn them. If you don't, their blood will be on your hands. We have a responsibility. I have an uncle who, I don't know where he is now. He's in eternity somewhere. I only, I only met him twice in my whole life. Uh, my dad had six brothers over seven, seven boys. And uh, he was the youngest. His name was Walker. I know that's not a Greek name, but... One of the neighbors named him because when he was little, he'd walk everywhere. And they said, boy, he's a little walker, isn't he? So that's what they named him. Uh, but the family by then had been making some money, so they put him through college. And he, be he became an ambassador to a country in Africa. And he was an attorney and all this other stuff. And every time I ever saw him, he had a suit and tie on. And he was difficult to talk to because his words were this long. You know, it wasn't like Jesus who kept it down on the ground where we can all get it. So, but I remember, I remember seeing him and thinking, wow, he, he's an ambassador. And then when I got saved, I read this. We're all ambassadors for Christ. God has called us to be ambassadors. An ambassador is someone who goes into a foreign land and brings the news of that land to this land. And so we're ambassadors. We're to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to others. That's what we're here for. We're not here to be entertained. We're not here to be patted and told how good we are. We're here to say, Father, oh man, these verses right here were just like, the first time I ever read them, it was like, oh God, forgive me. 
Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, because of God's mercies, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And let no man think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but let him think soberly according to the measure of faith which God has given to every man. So I went back to that first verse, my reasonable service. What does that mean? What does that mean, reasonable? Well, this came to me. I was in heaven, Jesus said. I gave up my crown. I gave up my robe. I gave up my position of King of Kings and Lord of Lords to come to this earth in the form of a baby. And when I came here as a baby, I was just like everyone else. And I was raised up by my parents and I learned to trade through my father Joseph. But my heavenly father called me when I was 30 years old. And I went about preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And then they tried to kill me. And, but they couldn't. In fact, I went to my hometown and they tried to throw me off a cliff. But I turned around and stared at them and they all moved aside and I walked through the midst of them. They couldn't touch me. But one day, one of my disciples named Judas betrayed me to the Pharisees. No worries. It was, it was my father's plan all along to die for the human race. So they, they accused me. They spit on me. They called me a devil. They told me that I was of Satan. They, they ripped the skin off my back with 40 lashes. They, they took a, a crown of thorns and slammed it onto my head. And, and I was, it hurt so bad. I was bleeding. And my back was ripped off. And then they put this robe on me. And they, the purple robe, it means royalty. And then they took a stick and they were beating me with it. And then when the blood dried, they ripped the robe off and started all the bleeding over again. And not only that, but they made me wear this, this heavy cross made out of railroad timbers in your language. And they had me drag it up this hill called Calvary. And I couldn't do it. So they had this other man named Simon help me. And they dragged me up and they slammed me on top of it. And they nailed my hands and my feet to the cross. And then they picked me up and they had dug a hole and they slammed it into the hole. And that's why David wrote, all of my bones are out of joint in Psalm 22. Because when they slammed me in the hole, all my bones came out of joint, but not one was broken. You can imagine the pain I was in. So Greg, it is your reasonable service to do whatever I ask you to do. Because you don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to me. I bought you with a price. Therefore, you are to glorify me with your body and with your spirit, which now belong to my Father. But the people were deceived because they didn't test it. See, we test things by the word. There's a, there's a woman in the book of Acts who followed Paul and, and uh, Silas around. These are the servants of the Most High God and they show you the way to salvation. And Paul turned around and rebuked her and cast the demons out of her. And I thought, wait a minute. She was doing something good. She said, these are the servants of the Most High God and they show you the way of salvation. And the Lord put a scripture into my mind just like that. Study to show yourself approved unto me, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So I, I did. I studied. I looked at that verse. In the Greek, do you know what it says? These are the men of the Most High God. They show you a way to salvation. That's why Paul rebuked her. I don't know why King Jimmy put in the, but it's a, a way. So in other words, there's other ways too. So now we have a world full of people that, oh, Jesus isn't the only way. This way's okay. That way's okay. 
That way is not okay. There is only one way, one truth, one life. No one will come to the Father except through that one way. Amen? You say, man, you're narrow-minded. You think I'm narrow-minded, you ought to talk to Jesus. He paid it all. He's the one that bought me. He's the one that bought you. He can say what he wants to say because he's God. And he told the truth. I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. No man will come unto the Father but by me. I loved Launmi's testimony of her grandmother, sister. She came from a African country where a lot of her relatives were Muslim. And thank God her mom is a preacher and they love the Lord, but grandma wasn't saved. And grandma didn't know the Lord. And grandmother was on her bed of sickness and languishing and she went. And then she came back. And then she went again. And then she came back again. And she said a word, I think it's a Nigerian, it means mercy. Well, Lawumi has a, a cousin named Mercy. So she came back and was saying, Mercy, I, I need mercy, I need mercy. And they were telling her, she's not here. She's not here. She saw the gates, came back and said, I saw him, I need mercy. And we believe she is in the Lord now. Praise God. Hallelujah. God's doing that all over the place now. He's allowing people on the operating table to go and come back and give a witness. I'm coming soon. I saw the gates. Not everybody sees the gates either. Some people have come back and seen the fire. So, our God is love. But our God is also judgment. We want to be the right side. We want to be on the right side of God. The love of God. He loves us with an everlasting love. But if we reject Him, and we believe the lie, we shall not see life. But the wrath of God will abide on us. God says, test the spirits, 1 John 4, 1. Whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out of the world. So when you're listening to sermons on the internet or wherever, test it with the word. I mean, there's all kinds of preachers now saying, well, you know, LGBTQ, ABC, NYZ, whatever it is. It's okay. It's not okay. Lying isn't okay. Gluttony isn't okay. Gossip isn't okay. None of it's okay. We have to tell these people the truth. Otherwise, at the great white throne, it'll be the bony finger. You never told me. You never told me. The people didn't test what they were hearing. So Jesus warned his disciples about this kind of deception. And I want to read just a few verses to you out of Matthew 24. These are the words of Christ, our Savior. And this is what he said about deception. Matthew 24, verse 3. Now as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, and they said, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming, and what will be the sign of the end of the world? Good questions. And Jesus answered and said to them, First of all, take heed that no man deceives you. Don't let anybody deceive you. I, I, I'm just going to say this. I don't care. I'm going to get in trouble anyway. Most all the media news stations have a plan. Do you think it's a coincidence that ABC, NBC, CBS... MSNBC, CNN, the Communist News Network, and all the others had the very same words to say about J.D. Vance, the new Vice President of the United States. He's weird. He doesn't laugh. And then the next station. He's weird. He doesn't laugh. Every one of them 
like little parrots, said the same thing. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, they're trying to groom me. They're all telling lies, the same lie. And if they tell the same lie long enough, Joseph Goebbels said, and if you don't know who that is, that was Hitler's propaganda minister in World War II. Joseph Goebbels said this, tell them enough lies long enough and they'll believe the lies. And they did. We're not going to do that. Because we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit arrests the lies and tells us the truth. But we have to know the truth. We have to be in God's word and know his truth. I, I put it this way. Read God's love letter. 66 books worth. Read God's love letter. Study it. Say, God, what do you want to say to me today? If you're troubled, read Psalms, the book of Psalms. David was the most troubled man in scripture. If you need wisdom, uh, read Solomon, the book of Proverbs. If you're depressed, read Song of Solomon, or excuse me, not Song of Solomon, read Ecclesiastes. And you can see how depressed he got. And the kind of foolishness that poured out in that. So the Bible has every answer we ever need. Every answer. But the main answer is Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I beg people all the time, come to Jesus. Look, you don't have to do anything. Just stop what you're doing. Turn to him. Believe that he is the Lord. Believe that he wants to save you. Believe that he paid for your sin. And ask him to come into your life. You know, believe, receive, and follow. It's, it's really quite simple. Religion makes it very difficult. <laughs> I had a religious woman tell me one time when I first got saved, you boys go to the movie show after church? I said, yeah, we're all single. We're in our 20s. What else is there to do till, till night church? So yeah, we try to find a movie that's okay. And back in the 80s, most of them were. She said, well, if you're in the movie theater, Jesus comes, you're going to get left behind. And man, I heard that, so I just got so sick of that. So one day, when I did get in trouble for it, but praise the Lord. One day, uh, she came up and said that, and I said, yeah, well, if you're still gossiping about our pastor, and Jesus comes, you're going to get left behind too. <laughs> so... That went over like a pork chop in a synagogue. You know, it flew in about two feet and held, went to the ground, got slapped down. So I got to church that night. My pastor said, so I said, me? And he said, there's nobody else standing there. So I went to his office and he goes, what did you say to her? And I said, I told her if she kept gossiping about you, that she would get left behind too. He laughed and he goes, good for you, brother. She's been doing that for years. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad God used you. God bless you. And, and I said, thanks, Pastor. And he says, okay, you, you can go. I just want to find out what you said to her. Because she came in here madder in a wet hand. <laughs> Let no man deceive you. Matthew 24, 4, verse 5. For many will come in my name, Jesus said. And they'll say, I'm the Christ. Now, I used to think they would say, I'm Jesus. No, that's not what, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus said, many will come and say, oh, oh, he's the Christ. But then they'll deceive you. And how many people have been deceived? Well, he's preaching Jesus. Well, they studied the scripture daily to see if those things were so. Amen? Moving on. We really have been warned about being deceived. God, God cares for us. He already warned us. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the last days or the latter times, some will depart from the faith and they'll begin to to, to listen to deceiving spirits and teachings from demons. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, 
having their own conscience seared as with a hot iron. So we have a denomination in the United States. Half of them, a huge denomination. In fact, at the turn of the century, they were the most on fire Christians in this country. They were building churches like mad all over the place and they preached fire and brimstone along with the love of God. The whole council. The whole council, just like Jesus. And, you know, now we're in the 2000s and half of them said, well, you know, we want to love everybody so we don't mind if drag queens and, and homosexuals and perverts get up in the pulpit and teach. We're, we, we don't mind about that. And the other half said, no way. That's against the Bible. The Bible in Romans chapter 1 specifically says that's an abomination to God. Deuteronomy 22.5 says anyone that's a man that puts on the clothing of a woman or a woman who puts on the clothing of a man is an abomination to God. Did you know that? Same God, yesterday, today, and forever. So God wants a distinction between the sexes. I don't, I don't believe... God wants women killing people in war. Women are made to nurture and love. Women are, are a picture of the Holy Spirit, the love and the teaching and the nurturing. You know, everybody had a mom. Everybody had a mom in here. And you remember your mom, how when you skinned your knees or you hurt yourself and she comforted you and, and talked to you and your dad said, you idiot, don't do it next time. But your mom comforted you. Amen. Do you remember that? And now the world's trying to take away the femininity of ladies and turn them into something else. And that's wrong. I'm not saying women can't be in the military. I'm saying that I don't believe that women are cut out to go to war and shoot people and kill them. I believe men are cut out to that. Hey, read the Bible. The Bible says the mighty men of David went out and went to war. The men of, of, of Solomon went out and went to war. I never see any woman going out and picking up a sword and whacking anybody. So that wasn't even in my notes. But I'm telling you that I believe this world is upside down and they're trying to pervert what God wanted to happen in this world. Somebody came up to me a couple weeks ago and said, did you hear about the man that had a baby? I said, I said, What? He said, yeah, it's on the news. And I said, just get thee behind me, Satan. I don't even want to hear that. You know, it's time. It's time. We have to stand, church. So, in closing, how do we avoid being deceived? How do we do that? I mean, it's good to say, this is what you need to do, and then don't teach us how, so now what do we do? So now this is what we do in order to not be deceived. So the first thing I did is turn off the one-eyed Hezekiah called the TV. I haven't watched news in nine years now. Now, I do see some headlines from time to time on my email, but I won't watch those guys because they're liars. They have an agenda to pervert the truth and we're not going for it don't you think it's strange well you're not supposed to talk about politics pastor yeah well I will anyway all of a sudden lame duck VP Harris who's never done anything not even go to the border now she's the queen Kamala you know she's awesome I mean she's her and Trump are neck to neck and if they repeat that lie long enough, people will believe it. And you know what? I don't really like yellow school buses that much anyway. I used to ride to school in a 56 Ford Fairlane to high school. I wouldn't ride the bus. And now that she talks about them, I don't want to ride the bus anymore, period. What has been will be. And what will be has been. And I, come on. You moron want to be the President of the United States? Are you kidding me? I told a guy the other day, I thought we were going to get in a fist fight, but we didn't. 
He says, well, are you voting for Trump? I said, it's none of your business who I'm voting for, but I'm voting for righteousness. I'm voting for my conscience before the Lord. And he looked at me and says, you want to know who I'm voting for? And I said, if you vote Democrat, you're a demon. <laughs> so, put up or shut up. And he shut up and walked away. And he claims to be a believer. I don't see how anybody who's a believer in Jesus Christ could vote for wickedness. That is crazy. And forgive me, that's my sermon right before the election. But I just had to get that part out. <laughs> well, there's separation of church and state. The Constitution doesn't say that at all. It says the government shall not interfere with religion. It doesn't say the other thing. That, and, of course, they don't teach the Constitution in our country anymore. So why would they know what it says anyway? And you know what's funny to me? Y'all think the same thing. I'm just saying it. <laughs> you know, everybody in here thinks exactly the same thing. I'm just bold enough to say it because people in jail need Jesus too. And that's why we're training up uh, Brother Tony and Brother Robert and others to preach in case that does happen. They will step right in here and this church will go on. Amen. How can we avoid being deceived? Well, number one, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Jesus said this. Not, not me, Jesus. If you continue in my word, then you will be my disciples, my taught ones indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So hallelujah to that. If I know the truth, I'm free. I'm free indeed, Jesus said. So they can take my body away, but they can't take my spirit away. And so we're not worried about that as Christians. What I'm concerned about is people that are going to go to the fire. That's what I'm concerned about. People say, man, you talk a lot about that. Because nobody else is. Or very few are. And, and it's real. I've studied it for 44 years. And the things would curl your hair, or uncurl your hair if you have curly hair. If you read the book of Job, starting with chapter 15, read about hell. It's the oldest book in the Bible. So God made sure the oldest book in the Bible has a very succinct account in Job 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 about the lake of fire and about hell and about what people do there. And it scared me so bad that I want to warn everybody I know about it. You say, well, that's not walking in love, brother. You know, the Bible says God is love. Here's love. If we go to the Grand Canyon, we're visiting, and you get too close to the edge and you start falling off, I don't care if I rip your shirt or not. I'm going to grab you and pull you back. That's love. I'll show you love. Well, I can't show you, but Jesus could. He could hold up his hands and say, this is love. My feet that have been punctured with basically a railroad spike. I'll show you love. I'll show you love enough that I laid down my life for you. That's love. Love isn't, well, we don't want to offend them, brother. The cross is offensive. We signed up. It's, offend it's offensive to everybody. But I thank God that it's our way to salvation. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. Remind them of these things, Paul writes to young Timothy, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words that don't profit to the ruin of the hearers. So be diligent to present yourself approved unto God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You are to shun profane and idle babblings. They will increase to more ungodliness. Just ignore it. Man, I really like what my wife said to me the other day. I'm tired of hearing this. Not the word. I'm tired of hearing all the crazy politicians stuff. We need to be in the Word. That way we will, really will be free. 
And you, I can see what they're doing to us. You know, I'm going to hammer you from this end, hammer you from that end, put fear over here, threats over here, fear over here, China's coming, this is a... You know what? Jesus is coming. And as soon as he comes, hallelujah, we're going up. And I feel sorry for those who don't. And so now I feel my assignment is preach the word. I felt that 44 years ago as well. Preach the word. And love the people. And in loving the people, you've got to tell them the truth. If you love your kids, you'll tell them not to sit on the railroad tracks when a train's coming. If you love your kids, you'll tell them, don't run out in the street, honey. Cars are coming by. Those who lie are doing it to gain control over our mind. So how do we avoid that? Psalm 19.7 The law of the Lord is perfect converting our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. And the truth of God is perfect making even wise those who are simple. Just be in the Word. I had, uh, I've had it happen several times, but the last time was years ago. A guy said, all you do is beat people over the head with the Bible. I said, thank, thank you. Yeah, I intend to do that. Hoping that some scriptures will go in because I know that the word of God won't return empty. It'll accomplish that which God pleases. Psalm 119, 105. Your word, Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Notice he didn't say, it's shining one mile ahead of you. It's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In other words, God says, I'm not going to tell you where you're going to be in a week from now or two weeks from now. I'm concerned with where you are right now. And I'm just going to shine the light right where you are so that you'll know right where to walk. And you know, the liars are great pretenders. They have an agenda to harm us. But they speak so well. They're so popular. Everybody likes them. Well, this wasn't in my notes either, but the scripture says, Blessed are you when men shall cast out your name as evil and accuse you of all things because of his name's sake. But woe unto you when all men speak well of you. For so did they speak about the false prophets before you. Think about that. Well, they're... They're so well spoken. Yeah, I'm kind of allergic to word salad anyway. But 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 14 and 15 says this. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14 says, No marvel, no wonder. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great mystery if his ministers transform themselves into ministers of righteousness but their end will be according to their own works it's so important to understand the word of God this, uh, I hope this is a true story I thought it was a great story in the 1500's this man was in prison and it's not like today where they have libraries and you know they can become attorneys and lift weights and kill each other this was a hole in the dirt with a rock in front of it, and that's called a prison. And so this saint of God was thrown in prison for talking about Jesus in the 1500s. Those are called the Dark Ages, by the way. So he's in there, and he's praying to the Lord, and, and worshiping the Lord, and all of a sudden this bright light shows up in the corner. And he's looking, and it kind of looks like an angel, and he's standing, you know, big, tall, bright light. And he looks and he goes, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus, worship me. And he started to begin to worship and he said, let me see your hands. And it went away just like that. Let me see your hands. See, Thomas said that. I won't believe until I see his hands. Once I see the holes in his hands and put my, my hand in his side, then I'll believe. And I think we as Christians need to say, let me see your hands. 
Amen? We need the truth. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us how to walk away from deception. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the, in the end times. And doing, having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. If you read the armor of God, every piece of God's armor is his word. Every single piece. And he even says that towards the end of Ephesians 6. He says, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You say, why is the word so important? Because it's alive. The word is very powerful. Very powerful. And it changes hearts and lives. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 23, I believe it is, God says, is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? And it's so true. The word of God breaks apart our rocky heart. So, God has given us ample warning in Scripture. And I just want to read this next two verses and then we're going to uh, partake in communion. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9. Fran, praise God for the word. Amen? Yeah, Fran and I got kicked out of church for preaching the word, telling the truth. Back in 1991, I think. Yeah, we were... We were <laughs> Fran's 95 now. Happy birthday. Praise the Lord. Yeah, she wasn't 95 then. She was 60-something, two or three. And I was young, and we confronted somebody about some things they were saying, and they were in leadership in the church. And we told them the truth, and we got kicked out for it. Just go to the next one. <laughs> and we did. And we did. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. Church, they're here. It, it, it's, it's way past time for people to say, oh, everything's going to be fine. Did you know that Russian jets were flying over our, our airspace in, uh, in uh, Alaska? Checking us out. Checking us out. Verse 2. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, and blasphemies, disobedient to their parents, They'll be unthankful and unholy, unloving. Yeah, I would have to say it's unloving to leave a bleeding woman in a parking lot after you ran over her twice. Unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, and despisers of those who are good. They will be traitors, headstrong, haughty, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they will have a form of godliness, but they're going to deny God's power. From such people, you are to turn away. Turn away. For of this sort of those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women who are loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, they're always learning, but they're never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So the Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door. And if I'm available, I talk to them. I have a family member who's been one for 45 years. I talk to them. I tell them the truth. I listen to them. And then I tell them, you know, can I, can I show you some things in your Bible? And they always walk away scratching their head, number one, because I didn't slam the door on them. And number two, because I asked them questions that they couldn't answer. Because the only ones that can answer them are the ones who've been born again, who know the truth. Don't slam the door on them. Get versed in the Word of God so that you can lead them to Christ. They're looking too. You know, they don't have the truth, but they're looking. So help them along the way. Amen? 
And if they want to argue, don't argue with them. The Bible says the servant of the Lord must not argue with people. Don't argue with them. You know, and I have people tell me, why do you always have to be right? I tell them, I'm not always right. God's word's right. You have a right to be wrong if you want to. You know, <laughs> that's not very offensive. Acts chapter 20, if you'll turn there with me, is my final scripture today. Acts chapter 20. How many of you have ever been in a church where you were so blessed and your pastor fed you and encouraged you and taught the truth and then one day he got up and said, God's calling me to another ministry. Anybody in here experienced that before? Had your first pastor take off and go to another church? I have. Man, we cried. We wept. I mean, he's the first guy that ever taught me the word of God. The first guy that, you know, I, he was my hero in the faith. And I found out quickly that men make mistakes, and that's okay too. But the Apostle Paul here in this story is going through the same thing. He's been in Ephesus teaching him for a long time. People have gotten saved. People have gotten delivered from demonic activity. People have, have, have got rid of their idols. They're saved. They're happy. They're, they're in fellowship. They're, they love the Apostle Paul. And so in Acts chapter 20 and verse 25, the Apostle Paul visits all the elders of the church in Ephesus. And he says this, Indeed, I know now that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, you will not see my face anymore. Paul was headed to a Roman prison where they cut his head off for preaching the gospel. So Paul was telling him, you guys, I love you. I've been with you all this time now. I've led you to Christ. You're, you're doing a great job, but you're never going to see my face again. Not now. You'll see it up there, but not here. He says, therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Now, I want to define that. Paul had Christians drug out of their house when his name was Saul, and they were murdered. When the Apostle Paul said, I'm free from the blood of all men, he was saying, I have been forgiven of my past. I am completely forgiven. And I am forgiven in my future because, the next verse, because I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Paul said, my, my past is forgiven. I have been forgiven of everything I did when I was a heathen. And now that I'm a Christian, I'm forgiven. And the blood is not on my hands because I've told you the entire truth. Heaven, hell, holiness, righteousness, repentance. I've told it all to you. He said, therefore, be careful. So here's Paul. Here's the heart of Paul. Kind of like what Sandra said in the parking lot as she's laying there. Please take care of the children. Please make sure. You know, that's, she served God for 65 years. 65. Therefore, take heed to yourselves. And to all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Because I know this, after I leave, savage wolves will come in and they won't spare the flock. My first church. Pastor left. There was a power struggle to see who would be the pastor. Boom, the church split up and it's still splitting to this day, 40 years later. There's five different churches that have come out of that church now. Just split, 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 argue, split, split. It's not a competition. Actually, do you know what the word diakonos means in the Greek? In English, it means deacon or, or leader, it means servant. It means servant. That's what it means. It doesn't mean Lord. doesn't mean master. It means servant. So that's what we've been called to, all of us. I've been called to that. You've been called to that. Servant. I thank God yesterday. Uh, 
I, I won't say who it was, but I will say we have a sister in the Lord who didn't have a bed to sleep on. So I called a couple of brothers up, and uh, they're always here. And they said, sure, pastor, we'll, we'll go. And so we went up to another city, and there was a model house that they were just getting rid of all their furniture, and there was a brand new bed, never been slept in. And they spent the whole day taking the bed apart, putting it in their vehicle, driving back here and helping our sister put it in her house and put it up and fix it up. And that's what I'm talking about. That's, that's the kind of church I want to belong to. That's the kind of people that, you know, we're family. And I know you, some of you think you're going to get rid of me. We are going to be together for eternity. The Apostle Paul said, after I leave, savage wolves are going to come in and, de and devour or not spare the flock. And also from among yourselves, people will rise up, they will speak perverse things and draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, you are to watch and to remember that for the space of three years, Paul said, I did not cease to warn everyone day and night with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who were sanctified. And then Paul said something that TV evangelists hate. Did you know that? This is what he said. I have coveted nobody's silver or gold. Well, I'd never fly in the 2020s. I have not coveted any silver or any gold. You know what Paul was saying? He said, Ephesus, I love you guys. And I'm saying it today, I love you guys. And gals, I would not tell you the truth if I didn't love you. If I didn't love you, I'd let you go on your merry way. Uh, I wrote the bulletin this week on purpose. And I thank God for the faithfulness of people in this church. But some of us need to be woke up. And if I didn't love you, I wouldn't try to wake you up. I'd just say, sleep on. That's not love. Amen? Amen. So, would you stand with me? We're going to go ahead and prepare for communion. I want to let you... that was due for our peace was laid on you by